live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? <clears throat> I guess I'm already sick. Wow. Uh, we're back. We're back on the air live, and uh, I don't know. I guess I wish we weren't just because uh, I, the world has gone crazy. As it turns out, news kept happening, even though we were pleasantly engaged, I guess, in a mini college tour with our eldest. Uh, pleasant in the sense that, uh, well, how nice these college campuses are. Unpleasant and uh, so far as, uh, oh, my God. I don't know if you're going to be able to do this because it costs so much money. These places, it's unbelievable. Of course, you know that already. Uh, it's been in the news. If you've had any kids who've gone through college anytime, probably in the last, uh, honestly, 50 years, you are, uh, I mean, the, the, the prices have increased dramatically, of course, but you remember the sticker shock very well. Those of you getting ready to get that sticker shock, well, good luck to you. And uh, it doesn't really matter where you go or uh, what direction you're headed in. There's sticker shock somewhere for you. Even if you're staying locally, going to a state school, can't believe what they charge. And, of course, <clears throat> you learn very well, I suppose, if you believe what you hear. And I have no reason not to believe what I'm hearing from administrators. The cost of college is not even close to what it actually costs to do what they do. It's just uh, that's how much they still need to charge you and not go bankrupt uh, <clears throat> by tapping into all of their uh, endowment and reserves. It's amazing what it costs to do this sort of thing and uh, amazing how little we pay teachers along the way who prepare our kids to do this. Uh, but uh, life's not fair. If it were, we wouldn't need this radio show so much, I guess. So uh, time to catch up with everything and uh, all the signals look good. Thumbs up from Justice, reminding me of many of the... Uh, Fairly stupid things that happened over the last couple of days. We'll catch up, of course. Greg Dworkin will be here. Excellent way to re-enter the uh, the radio stream, if you will, so that uh, we can get a roundup of the news that we ignored while we were looking for. Are we on the proper parking deck? What time does the tour leave? Uh, will you please wake up and pay some attention to what we're doing here? Uh, you know, all the fun things that we would have done over the weekend. <clears throat> And uh, and and so much more. Uh, Justice uh, reminding me of some of the other follies that uh, occurred both uh, since Friday on our way up to uh, to start this tour, and while we were out and about walking around on the uh, beautiful but a little bit frigid <laughs> college campuses in our northeast here. Uh, man, where to even start with this stuff? I don't know. Uh, I, I am reminded just this morning, just by watching what is flying by on Twitter, that I hope you have been working as hard as I have in understanding gun culture, as we were admonished to do not long ago by, I don't even remember which of the highbrow gun folk it was. I don't know what it is that they think they're looking at when they say, you know, we got to learn, we're we we liberal elites who are uh, so down on gun, gun culture. I just great example of the sort of dumb stuff that I guess you're supposed to roll into uh, the 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 culture that you're supposed to respect. And I guess this is really where I object to the whole thing. Is uh, of course we're dealing very often not when we're dealing with the authors of such pieces. Usually, <clears throat> pardon me, really not uh, getting cleared up here yet. Just yet. Come on, Claritin. Let's let's make for a good show today. Uh, when we, I, I think the authors of pieces like this don't themselves have any idea what gun culture really is. I think they have some ideal of what gun culture is to them. Me and my buddies who uh, <clears throat> responsibly clean our pistols down at the range and talk about how protective we are of our families and yada yada. I guess that I mean that's a sub culture of gun culture but then we also have stories like this one currently making the rounds uh i will just uh, read you the quick uh run down to the headline and tweeted blurb here kentucky teen used money mom gave him for tattoo 
I could stop there. <clears throat> to buy an AR-15 to, uh, well, to, 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 to school, shoot up the school, police say, is how they put it. This uh, Fox News reporting it, and so if you wanted to learn to understand gun culture, presumably you would turn to the Fox News channel. Uh, Kathleen Joyce wrote this one up. The story is from out of where? Lexington, Kentucky. Which, fair enough, right? Maybe that's gun culture. Maybe it's not. A Kentucky teenager used his money, <clears throat> or rather money his mother gave him, not his money, for a tattoo to buy an AR-15 rifle and 500 rounds of ammunition meant to shoot up his high school, police said. Of course, the police could be lying. You never know. But uh, <clears throat> right from the beginning, I'm having difficulty respecting the culture. Uh, your mom gave you money for a tattoo. Ah, mom. And I don't know, maybe that's, am I being elitist about that? I mean, kids get tattoos now. I'm I'm still, I'm perhaps like the last of the uh, people, uh, I don't know, how, how old do you have to be before you, before you uh, originally thought of tattoos as something rather sordid in themselves? I mean, you know, there's a cultural thing there going on too, but... Uh, you know, certainly there were uh, people, it was very edgy, you know, <laughs> when I was a kid. Oh, my goodness, a tattoo. But it became sort of a, a common thing. And kids get tattooed all the time now. They don't think twice about it. And uh, sometimes rather heavily tattooed at that. But it never would have occurred to me, say, if I wanted a tattoo, if I was really definitely, I'm one of those trendsetters, Back in my day, I'm just going to go right out there and get a tattoo. And I mean, people got them. You know, the, the kids would get little cartoon character tattoos. Teenage kids, uh, college kids, get some kind of dumb thing tattooed on them uh, while on spring break or something like that. Right. But I never would have thought to go and ask my mom for the tattoo money, for one thing. I guess that's just maybe that's just the difference between me and the kids today. The second thing I guess I would add is an AR-15 is not a cheap weapon so it's the the underlying the uh, unstated part of this story is if mom gives you money for a tattoo one that's a problem two if mom gives you enough money for a tattoo that you could say eh it's fungible instead of the tattoo i'll get a six hundred dollar at a minimum six hundred dollar gun and 500 rounds of ammunition like wow mom what kind of tattoo were you after i'm very curious to find out but i just i guess just to wrap this whole thing up because greg is here now and we can get serious for once on this show um i i wonder whether the people writing these fabulous very erudite uh arguments that we need to understand gun culture really do themselves understand gun culture because this is a huge part of it. I want to get a gun because it's military looking. I want to get a gun because I've been telling kids in school that I was going to shoot them first when they wouldn't, whatever, eat their lunch with me or whatever, it, or give me the seat I wanted. Or you're too much of a popular cheerleader, so you're going first. That's a very big part of gun culture. Those T-shirts I see all the time of people uh, shooting out at the range, and on the back of the T-shirt says uh, "Vote from the rooftops," right? You know, it's you can't deny. And if you go to gun shows, you'll get a good look at what gun culture really is. And I don't think the people writing these columns have any idea what's included in it. And if you ask around, by the way, the great irony of the whole thing is. Talk to people about culture and cultural understanding. Well, first thing you got to understand is Islam isn't a religion. They're all jihadis. Mexicans are rapists. Uh, libtards deserve to hang. And please understand my culture. There you go. Uh, I, but, you know, gun culture, like every other culture, is changing dramatically. Everywhere else, they want to use their gun culture to machine gun all the change to death. The rest of you, though, have to understand, eh, sure, some people want things like this. Yes, yeah, all right, very good, thanks. Greg sharing with me a, uh, a random assortment of great gun T-shirts that are out there that you can pick up. Of course, you, you might have seen the, uh, the uh, surfing line. I think that's surfing line, right? Salt Life. Of course, he's got one here with Assault Life in there in their type font, and it's an assault weapon that accompanies it rather than one of the nice natural wave type motifs. Uh, there's a very definite gun culture that 
these guys who are writing about gun culture and how we need to respect it are absolutely ignoring and they think it's outliers and it really isn't. And increasingly it's becoming, I think, the bulk of gun culture. And that that's on gun culture nuts, to be honest. If you think gun culture should be about proper weapon care and safety training, uh, let's see you speak up. Let's see you down at the range. Let's see you at the shops. Let's see you at the gun shows telling people, you know what? You and a weapon don't really belong together yet until you understand gun culture. Why isn't the pressure for you yahoos to understand gun culture before you're allowed to buy? Well, because Second Amendment? Well, welcome to the rest of our culture. Welcome to constitutional law. Welcome to law and order. Welcome to not getting shot accidentally through the hotel room wall because Yahoo wanted to join gun culture yesterday at the gun show and nobody asked him, was he a felon? And boom, he didn't know what he was doing, and he didn't care. And he, let's say, hypothetically, shoots a member of a 13 and under traveling soccer team that happens to be in the next room. Because that happened, I don't know. Anyway, uh, not really the news per se, but, uh, well, this story being in the news, I thought I'd bring that up. Makes for a good warm-up rant. Now we can make some room for the real news with Greg Dworkin. Hi, Greg. How are you? Hey, how are you? It's like 12 I'm minutes into the show, now. and I haven't mentioned Stormy Daniels yet. Right. Now, okay, I've been I just did, so that's there covered. Go. Please understand Stormy Daniels' culture, everyone. Thank you. Mm. Well, actually, I think a lot of people do. Yeah, I think they do. <laughs> you bet. And they understand Donald Trump's part in that culture, too, and it's why it's right, not working. Right. You've seen the T-shirts that said, you know, I watched Stormy Daniels Sunday night. I have not. Well, it didn't necessarily mean they watched it on oh. <laughs> 60 Minutes. <laughs> That's a good idea. If you have, those shirts don't exist, you, you want to make one. Well, you know, it just it's all part of a, uh, of a bigger deal. Let's go back to the gun stuff. A couple okay, of interesting sure. things happened. One, uh, John Paul Stevens decided to write an yes. essay about uh, why we should get rid of the Second Amendment. Yes, he did. Reasonably argued, just like his dissent in Heller was reasonably argued. And uh, both, uh, I think it was Scalia for the majority. Armando will have to check me on this. Uh, I am not a lawyer and I don't play one on the internets. But uh, I think it was uh, uh, Scalia who wrote that uh, this doesn't necessarily apply to all weapons if something is reasonably unusual. I forget his exact wording. Mm. And dangerous. Yeah, I think so. Then then you get to uh, uh, look at it in a different way. Uh, but... Uh, I think that John Paul Stevens' argument is terrific and completely politically untenable, and I don't think it helps to shift the discussion to say, you see, when we told you libtards were coming for our guns, that's exactly what we meant. Mm -hmm. So I found it uh, very interesting and uh, politically unhelpful. Yeah. Well, that's where I put things like understand gun culture, too. So that's good. Both sides. Mm, both sides. <laughs> uh, there's a poll. Uh, yes. There was a couple of polls. I think it was NBC that found the uh, NBC Wall Street Journal that found the NRA uh, less popular than it used to be. This one is from PPP, yes. came out yesterday, it came out uh, March 27th, which was yeah, yesterday. Right. Protesters are liked. Uh, the high school gun protesters are liked, but they don't like the NRA. PPP's okay. newest national poll finds that Americans like the high school students leading protests against gun violence across the country a whole lot more than they like the NRA. Huh. The high school students receive a positive 56-34. NRA is upside down with 39% of voters seeing it favorably and 44 negatively. Those negative views of the NRA are relatively recent, and I attribute a lot of that to the high school kids, not John Paul Stevens. Yes, I would think so. Well placed. Mm. There's 87% support for background checks for all gun buyers compared to 8% of voters who are opposed. That policy is the backing of 89% of Democrats, 85% of Republicans and independents. Hard to find anything Americans agree on, 87%, but this is it. Yeah. In fact, in the same poll, we found that only 81% think the sky is blue with 11% disputing that notion. Right. They always exactly. throw in fun questions just to see if people are paying attention. I am not. Mm. Well, you know, where we are, the sky's gray, so I, I totally get it. See? All right. right. You were correct. We also found 64 to 26% support for a ban on assault weapons. Again, with bipartisan agreement, Democrats 78-15, Independents 61-25, and Republicans 49-40. Hmm. Uh, and oh, uh, Armando. Armando, always helpful, actually has a link uh, okay. to the, the Heller-Scalia 
think. Yeah, I agree with him uh, that uh, Stevens' huh. dissent was better, but I just cited uh, Scalia for two reasons. One is it was the majority opinion. And secondly, if you cite Scalia pointing out that the gun ban isn't universal with Scalia being the conservative icon that he is, again, it's, you know, who is your messenger? Mm -hmm. So that, that's the reason I do that. Yes. But uh, I'll try to find the exact quote because uh, he did mention something about the uh, dangerous uh, weapons. Yes. Well, yeah. He, and I think it's very frequently cited to it. The, the right isn't necessarily absolute and uh, that there are limitations to the freedoms, whatever they may be in his mind. And, 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 and they went much further than usual, but even yeah. those expanded freedoms, like uh, the newfound right to uh, go armed in the street, which was not always, recognized that in fact had never been recognized prior to this uh, as a constitutional right. Even so, there were limitations to it. Right. It so he, he mentions the historical tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons. And I guess quotes around dangerous and unusual weapons because that itself is based on English law. Yeah. So, okay. uh, yeah, I mean, but uh, again, not absolute. So uh, the PPP poll, I think, in that sense is interesting. I'll tell you what's something that's even more interesting. Oh, good. All right. I'm ready uh, oh, and by the way, I'll just throw in that the generic congressional ballot in that poll is uh, 50, 39 Democrats. That's an 11 point lead. I mention that because everybody's talking about how the generic ballot is tightening. It's really not oh, about how okay. Trump's numbers are going up because the CNN poll had him go up by seven. But if you track it daily, the way the civics poll does, you don't find a rise. See a NBC poll that came out yesterday, but didn't get any play actually had Trump dropping three points. Things are stable, just so you know. Don't worry about those things. All right. What's more interesting, I think, is uh, people like uh, Ryan Costello. This is an absolute fascinating interview from the retiring GOP congressman. And when I say retiring, I don't mean shy and retiring. Wow. Okay. I mean spend more time with my family retiring. <laughs> okay, that kind. Okay. Uh, a retiring GOP congressman reflects on 15 months of chaos. It only took a week for Pennsylvania Representative Ryan Costello, a moderate Republican representing suburban Philly, to recognize the headwinds that Donald Trump's presidency would create for him and members in similar districts. After the travel ban, Costello said, uh, it wasn't just the overwhelming protests at airports, but also the protesters who gathered at his office. Mm -hmm. They were linking him to the Republican member of Congress with the decisions the new Republican president. He remembered the expectation that somehow I needed to issue a statement within X number of minutes or somehow I was complicit, whatever they were trying to accuse me of. And what that told me uh -huh. is that they were very engaged and there was a lot of anger and they were just waiting for Trump to do something so that they could express their outrage. Huh. He yes. gamely rattled off some of the difficult events from the past year. Charlottesville, firing a Comey, a couple of tweets. M M Mika Brzezinski tweet was something. Didn't he say cursing Gillibrand would do anything for money? Yes, he did. Things – that's the narrator voice. Mm -hmm. Things like that were little bumps in the road. It was stormy before there was stormy. The interviewer then asked him how Republican members in swing districts thread the needle when the president makes one of those remarks. And Costello said, there's no threading the needle. The more people you think you're trying to thread the needle, the more they're actually going to be critical. Anytime he spoke out against one of the president's comments, he knew exactly where the responses would fall. Never be enough for Democrats and other truly anti-Trump constituents. Might pass muster with the persuadable Republican or independents he needed to keep on board. But if you do that, you need to be prepared for the really pro-Trump Republicans to come at you for not sticking up or defending the president. It's a zero-sum calculation, he said. Hmm. Which I thought was perfect. And then he talks about how the health thing really got on him. The way these bots work, B-O-T-S, he spelled it out for me. Oh. Presumably referring to those deluging him with talking points. And these indivisible people, it's not like they think for themselves. They're just told what to say. They'll take whatever some other expert told them, like this Topher Spiro guy, or whatever his name is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good to get a shout out, Topher. That is indeed the name of the excitable Center for American Progress Policy Fellow. Such a lovely fellow who built up quite the Twitter presence during the healthcare fight by imploring his followers to flood congressional phone lines. Mm hmm. In other words, what you all out there in our listening audience did mattered. Yes. Uh, I should point out, by the way, that uh, it is not a new thing. What we did in the listening audience that mattered 
is what the Tea Party tried to do and in some cases was successful in, but on a much lower scale, as it turns out, uh, before. And, and that's why you have Congress people like Costello here who, uh, as you say, retiring but not shy and retiring. But, I mean, what do you, what do you know about Costello? What, what, what famous initiatives has he spearheaded? Why is he in Congress? And the answer is he hasn't done any. And he ran a campaign in a box that was supposed to work with the other set of people who were told what to say on the telephone. And then those people got overwhelmed by a different set. And uh, this is astonishing to him. Now, he did on occasion vote against stuff that Trump wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think the health care bill uh, he voted against. He was one of the votes against. Mm -hmm. OK, um, well, but it's it it's it is very difficult for somebody in a truly a swing district to support Trump. It just is. We're making it harder. That's fine. Yeah. Frankly, that's our job. I don't mean because uh, uh, George Soros and Marcos Melitzas pays us to do that. I mean, as Democrats who oppose Trump's policies, it's our job and it, it works. So, you know, the, the, the point there is you cannot satisfy rabid pro-Trump people and us at the same time. You can't. Right. And so if you're a moderate trying to split the difference in a place like Costello's old district, you can't. Good. So you better choose, and which side you choose is going to determine whether or not you survive. Here's a piece, uh, a, a tweet by G. Elliott Morris pointing out last night in Alabama, local, Democrats came within 5% of flipping an Alabama state legislative seat. The Republican won by uh, 4 or 5%. That's a seat that Trump won by 22% in that district. And Romney won it by 33 so the average swing in special elections is D plus 13. And per my models, because G. Elliott Morris is a political scientist who does models, per my models, Democrats are heading for the biggest wave election since the GOP revolution in 1994. OK, that's a nice. And he's got the data in the graphs to prove it. Can't really show those graphs on radio, uh, but we'll put a link. Scott Anderson will help us with that to put a link into the, um, the, the post that goes up later when we summarize the show. Yes, when you play at home. The special election tonight in ALHD 21 came roughly in line with expectations based on the lean of the seat. If Democrats keep this up through the fall, and we have every reason to believe they will, says G. Elliott Morris, November 6th is going to be a very bad night for the GOP. So uh, that, that's the background to all of this. And then we have the um, uh, March for Our Lives uh, events. Over two million people marched across the country. There was something like 800,000 people in D.C. This happened in, while you were away and covering um, a lot of stuff uh, yes. on the, the two-day sh live shows that you uh, recorded uh, so that you didn't broadcast them live, but they were news shows for Monday and Tuesday. Uh, some people were doing some analysis of exactly who those voters were. This is a fascinating piece that was in uh, the Monkey Cage blog, the uh, political science mm. blog over at the uh, Washington Post. Suburban voters – nope, not this one – uh, here it is. Here's who actually, well, I'll do these together. Here's who actually attended the March for Our Lives. I'll do that one first because I started okay. with it. No, it wasn't mostly young people. Okay. Did you know that? Uh, They're I leading us, but they sure. weren't the majority of people marching. Oh, okay. Well, you have to be able to drive to get there. <laughs> in oh, the days the before bus. and after, That's more true. than 2 million Americans participated in the March for Our Lives – the gun violence conversation is focused on Marjorie Stoneman Douglas survivors, MSD, and their student movement. The school shooting in Parkland and the passion of the teenage survivors have become a catalyst for the current movement. I like that. You know why? Because catalysts are small amount things that make larger things happen without wow. themselves getting used up. True, yes. Okay. So I love that. With the help of some well-resourced benefactors, including Oprah Winfrey and George Clooney, the survivors organized an extraordinary rally in D.C. and sister marches around the country in a mere six weeks. Yes. Huge However, numbers. the young faces of the advocates have created an assumption that youth and students are the core of the movement. My research tells a different story about who participated and is far more complicated and less well packaged for prime time. Oh. So this is a sociologist doing research, okay. field research out there counting people who are actually showing up in Washington. 
And this goes back to, you know, it's nice to have the data and fully understand. For example, when we say working class, who do we mean? Oh, who do you we, mean? we mean? We mean everybody. Yeah. <laughs> we mean, uh, we mean women of color. Yes. Right? I mean, you know, working class isn't white working class unless you say it that way. Yes. And working class as a larger group or low income people didn't necessarily vote for Donald Trump. No. It was white guys who were making $70,000 a year who voted for Donald Trump, you know. So it's one of those things that you just have to understand what the term means when you use the term. Okay. And so what do they have here? Uh, who makes up the resistance? Oh, am I supposed to answer this one now? What am I? Well, it's rhetorical, but you can. You know, we like to, <laughs> to pretend we're talking to each other instead of talking past each other uh, on the show. I guess. I don't libtards, I guess. Libtards, sure. Yeah. Women. Women. Uh, women and everything. They're this not only marching, they're not only voting, they're running. Yes. That's how Virginia uh, became Virginia in terms of the election that happened, not just Ralph Northam, but, you know, in the, in the House of Delegates and such. Right. So to go on with this Thank article, you. however, the young faces of the advocates have created this assumption that youth and students, as part of my research on the American resistance, that's a book she's writing, I've been working with a research team to survey protesters at all the large-scale protest events in Washington since President Trump's inauguration. Wow. By okay. snaking through the crowd, sampling every fifth person at designated increments within the staging area. And that's a classic, uh, for example, uh, uh, exit poll mm. thing. Every fifth person gets asked. Is that it? Okay. We're well, able we... to gather a field approximation of a random sample. After the break, we'll talk about what that sample showed. Yeah. All right. Well, that sounds like a rather arduous task, but I guess they're sticking to methodology. Somebody's got to do it better yeah. her than me. Uh, well, that's true. Clearly, the case, uh, she's, she's very adept at it, too. So, yeah, wow. I've got every 70, 145 responses. Amazing. All right. Let's round those up in two minutes. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Good morning and welcome back to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I say good morning because I fell asleep during the break. <laughs> I was still waiting for this Claritin to really do it. So it's beginning to clear things up a little bit. Ah, the uh, passageway is opening again, uh, drinking as much water as possible in two minutes. But uh, when we left off, we were talking with Greg Dworkin about, uh, really, well, uh, and, and Abby, uh, a remarkable uh, study of uh, on the ground, just actually talking to people at, well, is it every, yeah, it says uh, every one of the large scale protest events in Washington since inauguration. They're doing them all. Right now, and so they do some comparisons here. In the uh, gun march. Okay. Yeah. For example, she writes, like other resistance protests and like previous gun control marches, the March for Our Lives was mostly women. Whereas the 2017 Women's March was 85% women. That was at least the one in D.C. The March for Our Lives was 70% women. Further, participants were highly educated. 72% had a B.A. or higher. Okay. So It's an A.B. on the campus as I was on today. Well, B.A., A.B., yes. um, you know, just uh, you got a degree. Right. Okay. Uh, there are degrees of degrees, you know, and, and so you got one. That was one of them. So... Uh, contrary to what's been reported in many media accounts, the D.C. March for Our Lives crowd was not primarily made up of teenagers. Only about 10 percent of the participants were under 18. Now, uh, parenthetically, what they did, uh, which was very clever, is uh, like if you were old, you weren't allowed to talk. You could oh. sing, but the speakers were all kids. Oh, okay. Well, That's the point they enough. wanted to make. But that doesn't mean they organized to pay for it or attend it. Only about 10% of the participants were under 18. 
the average age of the adults in the crowd was just under 49 years old, which is older than participants of the other marches I've surveyed, mm. but similar to the age of the average participant at the Million Moms March in 2000, which was also about gun control. Ha, okay. Well, at least okay. that's interesting that that cohort has remained the same. But, but as I read this and look at some of these stats, keep this in mind. All right. One of the big dominating themes of that march was vote them out. And yes. one of the big things okay. that they did, they made sure that they did. They wanted to they talk about survey every fifth person. They wanted to register every fifth person. Mm. They I had a tremendous that. number of vote to register things. Pre, pre-register if you're a teen, but register to vote if you're not a teen. Yes. So lots of people so the point there things. is if the crowd wasn't kids, but in actuality was voting age adults and you got them to register, that's oh. a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and that's – yeah, you wouldn't think uh, – it's, it's funny. not a point that I've heard made yeah, yeah. and I'm making it now. You wouldn't think that that would be – you would be quickly. very busy. Like yeah. if I wa- – if you wade into a crowd of – uh, average age 49 and what was the percentage it had college degrees i'd say i'm not going to get anybody 72%, here 72 percent. yeah you won't get anybody in fact they got a lot of people hmm. they haven't come out with the numbers yet in terms of how many they've registered but you know i've seen estimates of upwards of half a million people that is that's pretty amazing across the country not at this just one yes. march. right right, right? Okay. But, but that was the whole point is to register people participants she writes were also more likely than those at recent margins to be first-time protesters hmm. About, which is why registering them might be fruitful. About 27% of participants at the March for Our Lives had never protested before. This group was less politically engaged. In general, only about a third of them had contacted an elected official in the last year, while about three quarters of the more seasoned protesters had. Mm. That, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a seasoned protester in that regard. I suppose if you asked me if I contacted an elected official, the proper question would be in the last week. <laughs> Yes, so you would count as seasoned, heavily Even seasoned. more interesting, the new protesters were less motivated by the issue of gun control. This is where it really gets interesting. Mm. In fact, only 12% of the people who were new to protesting reported that they were motivated to join the march because of gun control, compared to 60% of the participants with experience protesting. So if you were a first-timer, you weren't there because of the issue of um, – specifically uh, raising the age of 21, banning assault rifles, getting rid of high-capacity magazines. That wasn't the stuff that brought you there. New protesters reported being motivated by the issues of peace, 56%. Don't forget, Uh we might get into a nuclear war with North Korea. And Trump, 42%, who has been a galvanizing force for many protests. March for Our Lives protesters were also more likely to identify as ideologically moderate. About 16%, one-sixth, did so higher than at any other protest event since the inauguration. Now, unsurprisingly, it was still a very liberal crowd. 79% identified as left-leaning and 89% rewarded voting for Hillary Clinton. That means that 11% were mind changers. You know, we're always talking about this. Some sliver of the populace who you could talk to who could you could change their mind. That's that's the 11% who didn't vote for Clinton that were at this march. I don't know what right? they did. You're not, gonna, you're not going to be able to convince the base. <clears throat> They're the ones that wear the assault life shirts. That's not yes. what we're talking about here. But yeah, I just, I just uh, thought I'd throw that in. Well, it is. It's interesting. Although uh, I, I would, I got, well, you got a number of possible outcomes other than voting for Hillary Clinton or sure. Donald Trump. But clearly. if you didn't vote for Clinton uh, yes. well, yeah. and you are at this march, <laughs> I don't know if it matters, but yeah. if you were in Wisconsin or Pennsylvania, it certainly did. Uh-huh. True. Right, Thus, states. in some respects, the March for Our Lives mobilized a broader group, including many new protesters and more moderates in some previous marches. But a remaining question is whether this event will catalyze further action, either on gun control or on other issues, as other large scale demonstrations have. The March for Our Lives had the allure of a free concert. The event's website maintained a list of performers, but never listed the speakers. But it's one thing to turn out to watch Lynn Manuel Miranda and Ariana Grande f- perform, and quite another to vote in the midterm election in November. And that's always the thing. That's all nice. It's really good. But are you guys going to turn out and vote? Well, as we just went over, a lot of people are turning out in these uh, midterms, which are normally low turnout events, and they are voting. And guess what? They're voting for Democrats. So uh, the the old, well, these people never vote argument is not persuading me because have you been paying attention? Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, and then yeah. the companion piece that goes oh, with that. Okay. Uh, is from PowerPost, 
uh, from March 26th in the Washington Post. And the title is Suburban Voters Angry with Trump Threaten GOP's Grip on the House. Okay. And this talks about suburbs outside of Chicago. There it is. Uh, this is Peter Roskam's district. Got it. Control of the U.S. House will be decided in America's next political background of above-ground pools, bike trails, and oversized Tudor and Victorian houses full of working professionals like Carrie Sullivan, a Republican voter who cast her primary ballot last week for a Democrat. In a suburb outside of Chicago, Sullivan is determined to replace her congressman, six-term Peter Roskam, who she says she has supported in the past. His sin, she said, affiliation with President Trump. Just the lack of respect for women, the authoritarianism, it's too much. As a professional woman, it's very difficult for me to reconcile, and she is not alone. In Illinois' 6th Congressional District, 62,990 people voted Democratic last week. In 2014, the number... Eight thousand. Ah, oh, okay. So we're oh, we're talking about in the uh, primary. Okay. Yeah. In a district that voted for Mitt Romney in 2012 and Hillary Clinton in 2016, a warning is being sent in letters as big as bold and bold as any that have tr- hung on a Trump building. <laughs> if Republicans want to hold on to the House, they're going to have to compete in communities that had little to do with the working class regions that sent Trump to the White House in 2016. We've already been over that. Working class, no. <laughs> Mm-hmm. The 70,000 a year voters who are middle class that sent Trump to the White House in 2016, working class voter for Clinton. Affluent white collar suburb, they mean non college, but that doesn't necessarily translate as working class. Mm-hmm. Affluent white collar suburbs of Democratic cities uh, is what we're talking about here. And many of the most competitive house seats this year are in the Tony bedroom communities of LA, Chicago, Denver, Houston, Philadelphia, New York, and Washington. And so we were just talking about Ryan Costello, Philly suburbs. The balancing act for these Republicans is appealing to moderate voters enraged by Trump while trying to avoid alienating a party base enamored with the president. We were just talking about this. And guess what? Costello told us you can't do it. Mm. All right. Rocks Democrats had targeted Roskam early on, a GOP incumbent in a Clinton seat. Beyond those races, the Democrats' House win this month in suburban and rural Pennsylvania district. Trump won handily. That would be Connor Lamb. As well as last year's wins in Alabama and Virginia, underscore that dozens more districts are competitive. Suburban voters tend to be richer and better educated than the country as a whole. That's funny. Those are the same people that showed up at the march we were just talking about. Oh my goodness. That is bad news for Republicans who are struggling with a massive divide among white voters. Those with college degrees disapprove of the president by a margin of 20 points. Those without approve of him by nearly the same margin. Residents of the 21 Republican seats recently rated by the Cook Political Report to be the most vulnerable have a median household income 33% higher than the country as a whole. 30% of the voters in these districts are college-educated whites well higher than the 23% average for the country. And Roskam's district has the 15th highest median income in the country. In an interview, he made clear he's aware. I don't underestimate it. Both campaigns are going to be influenced and have to navigate through large national figures. Donald Trump and Nancy Pelosi, neither of whom are particularly popular in my district. Ha ha. You think those are equal. Good luck to you. Bye, Felicia. Hmm. Well. Art Art doesn't say that, but that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Right. I figured you were adding that. So, I mean, oh, well, Donald Trump, we'll just run against Nancy Pelosi. That worked great in Pennsylvania 18. uh, Yeah. I wonder, uh, let's see. Now, Roscombe mostly backbench kind of a guy too, but, but I, him He's I've heard of. He's Ways and Means Tax Policy yeah. subcommittees. He's not just the total he, backbencher. Yeah, no, I, his, his name is familiar to me and I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I know about how long he's been around, but, uh, how did it say in the article when Costello was first elected? Costello was a yeah. second termer. Okay. I think that probably has a lot to do with it, too, is, uh, I mean, the, the idea of running against, well, we'll just run against Nancy Pelosi is kind of a dated thing as well. Um, and, and I guess not surprising to me that Costello hasn't been through that. He didn't win any races based on that ever. And Roscom, it was in one of his boxes previously. So he went back to the box and took that well, out. Roscom's been there since 2007. So he's yeah. been there for, for a decade. And that's how he, yeah. That was but, but the thing that just, it, it always strikes me. Could do that. So weird is that um, 
there are people that just really think that like the whole answer to everything is I'll just run on lower taxes than Nancy Pelosi and then I'll win and that's it and it's going to work and the fact that it's failing all around me it's still going to work because it's going to work. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it depends what was in the last box you received basically or your last competitive race pretty much I guess probably locks in your ideas of how to win. I, I and I have to say I was talking about this with a friend of mine nothing I, I you know this particular topic running against Nancy Pelosi looking to see how the uh, Republicans in the house are responding to this year's tough election uh, uh, scenario for them I mean nothing has proved to me your uh, candidate in the box discussions as watching what's happening here hmm. they just they don't know how to respond they have no experience they don't have any thought process. Yeah. They don't understand the, the environment they're in. It's, it's just astounding. Well, yeah. Uh, formulaic candidates for whom the, 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 the environment has changed and they don't know what to do with it. So it is very interesting. And, and watching two people who e have equally uh, little idea of what to do, but one is, of course, sure of himself in that, uh, well, once I won a competitive race running against Nancy Pelosi, that was 10 years ago, but I'm sure it'll work again now. And one who hasn't faced that yet and says, that I think there might be no answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I didn't have one to start with and I'm not going to get one now. So, all right, well, uh, good on you for you're there for four years. You understand it very thoroughly. The other guy, 10, 12 years in office, no serious idea about anything that has changed in the last eight so rouskam is going to explain the tax deductions to his district that's his strategy i mean okay. literally his strategy are looks like tax deductions be. and nancy pelosi that's what he's running on the photo yeah. editors of both pieces did a great job they uh, uh, uh costello looks appropriately clueless and uh, you know lost and Roskam looks appropriately smug. Yeah, he really does. Uh, he he's pretty sure you can see behind his little round glasses there. Oh yeah, I'll explain the taxes to them. Sure. Such details are likely to compete, says the article, with the enormous upswing of enthusiasm that as many local Democrats encouraged on the eastern edge of the district. Ruth Scifio, fifty-eight, decided to start volunteering with the Democratic Party after attending the women's march in Washington the day after Trump's inauguration. Mm. An office manager with grown children, she's been knocking on doors for the first time in her life in the relatively conservative Algonquin Township. Never been something I've been comfortable doing, but I'm doing it now, and I've been finding people. So many people in my precinct thought they were the only Democrats were like an underground club. <laughs> yes. Okay, and then they talk about the special elections that they've won. This year's focus on wealthy voters is in large part an unexpected byproduct of Republican successes in carving up the nation's congressional seats to their advantage. Although Republicans won more than 55 percent of House seats in 2016, they received only 49 percent of the popular vote. Democratic voters have been corralled into urban districts, while Republicans have claimed rural areas, leaving suburban districts the bridge as, uh, as more likely battlegrounds. This worked fine for Republicans in the past when the party was able to compete better among white college-educated voters, a group that tends to vote in higher rates in off-year contests. Trump scrambled the math, although exit polling showed Trump won college-educated whites by three points. Only 38% of the group approved of Trump's performance in the mid-March Quinnipiac poll. By contrast, 55% of whites without a college degree approved of the president. Another of those data points that I say that there are Trump voters that you could uh, uh, convince. I mean, most of them probably are already there, uh, and the ones that are left are going to be a much harder sell. But don't write off everybody just because they were a Trump voter. Write off people who went to rallies. They're useless. Okay. In this Trump era, in very pronounced way, educational attainment is better predictor of white votes. Said Zach McCrary, a Democratic pollster who worked on the recent U.S. Senate race in Alabama, it tells you more than gender, tells you more than age. At a Republican retreat, Camp David, Republican House leaders briefed Trump on the danger and emphasized the need to focus much of the coming election on persuading moderates, not just turning out the GOP base. Well, you can step back and look and see what he's done and see how that's working. Yeah, he listened very well. Right. Now, GOP strategists see a glimmer of hope in focus groups that have shown moderate women who are turned off to Trump don't always connect the president to the party brand or their loyal or, or their local representatives. They say no morals, no ethics. He's a narcissist, but he's not a Republican. That's where the resistance 
badgering people like Ryan Costello mm. to say where you stand on a Trump vote or a Trump comment or a Trump tweet comes in because they've done a wonderful job tying Republicans to, well, are you going to support them or not? And that's why they find the situation untenable. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it's, it was interesting. So, so watching... keep protesting. Keep calling yeah. them. It's it's important. You got to do that. I'm glad that it upsets Costello and as well it should. And I mean, how did you think you were going to get out of this? A president of the United States who says, "I love chaos. I can't wait to create." Chaos. It's gonna it's gonna land well, on your lap. I can't man. tell you yet. I haven't got my talking points. But when I get my talking points, yeah. I'm simply going to stick to them, and it's going to work. Right. Order out of chaos. There we are. Finally, uh, yeah. I, I it's I'm, I'm amazed that the that the guy has. Uh, expressed this kind of astonishment. Well, I'm not the president. Why is everybody asking me to comment on what he says? What, what do you mm. What do you do for a living? You a garbage man? No, I mean, I'm really, if, if you have to step, if oh. somebody uh, came in a time machine and said, "Listen, this guy Kager X is going to stage the 2018 election to prove a point." I mean, it's the whole reason for the whole election, okay. <laughs> just to prove this point. <laughs> okay, you couldn't do it any better. All right. This can stock, I this candidate in the box stuff is like right there before your eyes. Look at it and appreciate that's what you're seeing. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, we've observed a few elections. That's all it takes, really. Yeah, I suppose. No special expertise. Just pay attention for Not exactly over an extended science. period of time. That is true. And you know, you have any idea what it costs to get trained in rocket science, by the way? Yeah. I'm getting uh, I told, I told you that's, that's my like favorite uh, uh, clip from one of the uh, Britcoms. A, an arrogant neurosurgeon wanders into a party and <laughs> starts telling everybody he's a neurosurgeon and whatever they do is, well, it's not exactly brain surgery, you know, what you do. It's cute. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's not exactly. And then, of course, the rocket science shows up at the party <laughs> and, uh, and listens, listens, listens to the guy bloviate and then just says, well, <laughs> it's not exactly rocket science. No, true. And finally, you just have to pair the two of them up. I got an idea for a sitcom now of uh, college roommates, one of whom is uh, pre-med and going to be a brain surgeon. The other is going to be a rocket scientist and wackiness ensues. And Roseanne yeah, Barr is but, in it. But, you know, I, it, it, I use this uh, video actually to teach my students. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it's, it's a don't be this guy, you know, don't be arrogant kind of thing. <laughs> That's good training. They don't, uh, they don't always give that training to doctors. and Somebody really needs to it's along the way. Right. Yes, I mean, absolutely. I think it's more important than which medicine you're going to use because that's going to change by the time you get there. Uh, that's probably true. Don't memorize besides, You can always look that up. What you really need to do is learn how to interview people and you need to learn how to listen. That is true. Like I demonstrate on the show every day. Shut up, David. I'm talking. What? <laughs> true. True. All right. But uh, yeah, well, uh, well worth doing it. I guess uh, I, they now save that for when you, I guess, do your residency. Do they ever do that in school, in medical school, or are they just too busy with the biology, et cetera. Teach you what? Teach you interviewing skills? Yeah. I mean, you know, what you're really going to be doing once you get out. Yeah, yeah. Well, your first two years of classwork and then your second two years okay. are um, uh, on-the-job training. So you're out there actually doing it. All right. Residents. Both your medical yes. students are out on the floor uh, seeing patients, talking to them, learning how to examine them, learning how to do all this stuff. All right. I see. And uh, I when I was a, um, a medical student, Yes. Probably the most interesting uh, rotation I had was the psychiatry rotation. Hmm. I can see why. Uh, I rotated through a, a VA hospital. Oh. And, uh, you know, it's hard to tell who was crazier, the doctors or the patients. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was uh, a, a fascinating experience. And one of the things that was part of the psychiatric rotation is with permission from the patient, they actually uh, filmed, they, they uh, uh, videoed an interview. So yeah. you would go do an interview and they would film it for about 20, 25 minutes. And then your classmates and your professors would critique your interview. Hmm. No You're familiar with this Tough. because, you know, when you have media training, that's exactly what happens. Yeah. Right. You do right, something right. and then uh, somebody really experienced will explain to you how you came across, what you were doing at the podium, what you were doing with your hands. You're familiar with this. Right. And, uh, you know, you, you learn things about yourself. Well, you know, I always fidget or I always do this with my hands when I should be doing that with my hands or the way I stand doesn't project this or that or something else. 
or, uh, you know, tone down the uh, uh, 27 syllable words or whatever it is you're doing that doesn't really uh, connect with your audience. And that could be pointed out to you. But in this particular training, it was, you know, how are you listening? There was there was uh, I'm very shy. Oh. You probably don't know this about me because, you know, you I'm always mean, telling Armando he's wrong, but, you know, I'm very shy. And so uh, if I meet a new person, in this case, I was a student, didn't know anything, and I was meeting a new patient, and I asked a couple of questions, and there was what you might call the pregnant pause. Hmm. Oh, I mean, yeah, you like know, that. The, where, that. Where there's silence and nothing is getting filled. We know on media, you don't like that. You always have to jump in and, and fill that. Right. We saw that with uh, uh, the Gonzalez six and a half minute silence as part of the March for uh, Our Lives. Yes, she stayed silent. Emma Gonzalez stayed silent for six and a half minutes, or, or the exact amount of time that uh, uh, the shooter was shooting. And yes. on television, they let that play. And when you see silence on television, it's really striking because you don't do that. Right, not allowed. Okay. And, and so anything. when you're meeting somebody and you're nervous and you have that kind of silence, normally what happens is you just like fill it yourself. Like you can't stand the silence. But me being so shy, I didn't know what to do. So I just sat there. <laughs> and it turned out oh, okay. that that was the right thing to do because all of a sudden this other person just started opening up and started talking. <laughs> Pretty good. It's amazing how you and, can and blunder And I was complimented into that. on my technique, and I said, <laughs> I was scared. I didn't know what to do. I'm really shy, so I didn't do anything. Well, that was the right thing to do. You should do that more often. That's, sometimes it works that way. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but but uh, anyway, all interesting stuff. Um, and uh, I, I do this just because, you know, we like to make this personal connection with the audience and just we're, we're not robots. We're not here to just be plastic uh, uh, anchor people and just uh, chat out things as if they don't matter. These are the things that that uh, you know sort of uh, molded us and uh, and and created uh, all of this. So you know, again, uh, we have a few minutes here, and and I'm going to get off the air and let you finish the show. But uh, I just, just uh, wanted to point out that if you've been a long time listener for two or three years to the show, um, yeah, this this whole thing about uh, process and candidates in a box, you know, it all comes full circle. Eventually, uh, well, about every two years, it becomes important again, but uh, uh, more so in a wave year, I guess. And so uh, I'm glad we've been laying the groundwork for that. We would be terrible as plastic anchors. We have no scripts on this show. So right. uh, there would be a lot of pregnant pauses. We, exactly. We, we so I'm going to interrupt you just so I could explain to people what a good listener I am. Yes. And uh, thank uh, my good friend David Waldman Kegra in the morning for uh, allowing me on the show, which, which I do a couple, three times a week. And uh, we have a great time together. Uh, we like talking politics. And you know what? A lot of politics is happening. Take care. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow. We'll do All it right. again. Excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Greg. We really needed to Ooh. lean on you this morning. Uh, appreciate your being there for uh, setting us straight and getting us back on track with things. I I'll take us back off track again because I do have – there were two other uh, gun incidents or developments in gun stories that uh, – to link back to the first thing not not quite as crazy as kentucky one more serious than the other but uh just sort of along the way i like to note these things along the way when they happen uh a uh, a, a concealed carrier in a where was this one it's in a kroger store in where i better pick this one up and get the details right anyway one of several who have uh gone Armed among the populace, let's say, just the uh, people who this was in the uh, in Michigan, as uh, I'm, I'm bringing up the story again here. Um, not Detroit, but uh, uh, it's Macomb. Is that how they say it? M-A-C-O-M-B, Macomb County, as opposed to Macomb County. I'm not certain. I know we've called the name before. Um, but uh, anyway, out at uh, the Kroger store, these are important line of stories really and i keep them separately uh on a pinterest board uh, interestingly enough so that i can appeal to people who uh, the demographic that shows up for instance for protests in washington might find themselves uh, well maybe back in the day i don't know if any is pinterest as popular and as trafficked as it 
once was, uh, I guess, in its uh, initial couple of days. And people sort of thought, oh, well, this will be where this will be a, a largely female cohort, uh, suburban moms there trading uh, recipes and pictures for decorating their kids' rooms. It was very stereotypical and horrible. Uh, but, uh, it, to the extent that it, it was true, if it was that, that really was actually the cohort I was hoping to reach. And I really wanted to kind of be a jarring difference in the middle of these pleasant crafting, crocheting, you know, creative, uh, lunch packing for kids kind of pin boards. Although I think that was largely overstated and, and stereotypical about what people were really using it for, but I thought I would use those pin boards to, uh, well, for one thing, put up the faces where I could find them, photographs of kids accidentally killed by guns during each year, but also a, an ongoing category, not uh, separated by year, of the, the people who have accidentally fired their guns while they were out shopping, dining, and uh, consumerizing otherwise uh, among the rest of us who either had no idea or no interest in their exercise of the Second Amendment. Just to remind you of how frequently people can, uh, in, in exercising their rights, inject themselves and their rights and their rights gone wrong into your everyday life. So here, just another the latest example. Kroger is just particularly interesting because Kroger's been kind of a corporate battleground as uh, the various... Gun safety advocates have implored the corporate leadership of oh, various retail stores, Kroger among them, to uh, to refuse to allow guns on their premises. Uh, and they made some minor dent in the Kroger stores. I guess the same corporate umbrella owns uh, another branch of stores that uh, stopped selling guns, stopped selling guns to those under the age of 21, and then some of the guns were removed entirely. This is an entirely different kind of mishap, but one they've been warned about for a long time and coming to fruition just as predicted. I'll tell you a little bit more after this. Welcome back now to the Kegger in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Just a one-minute break to reset for the top of the hour. It's the 10 o'clock hour here live on Eastern Daylight Time, which means uh, that we've got Joan McCarter on tap for hour two. So uh, another uh, another steady hand uh, in guiding us on the uh, on the path towards actually examining what's in the news rather than musing on things like this. But anyway, I just wanted to spit this story out, as we said, in case you're in the area of Macomb or Macomb, Macomb, uh, Michigan. It is the Kroger store at 21 Mile and Card Roads, just in case you were wondering. Uh, 23-year-old guy, concealed carry, licensed, the whole bit. Um, like I say, the whole bit. The 23-year-old the man part fits with the bit, too. There are, of course, concealed carriers of all ages. Just sort of pointing out that it tends to sometimes, sometimes to be the younger cohort. Although there's uh, there's probably, it's, it's binodal, I guess, uh, stati statisticians might say. Among the more elderly concealed carriers and the very young concealed carriers, it's a, you know not impossible by any means. A rarer story when a 44-year-old concealed carrier accidentally fires his weapon in the middle of Kroger. But uh, in this case, uh, I don't think he actually even I can't. Uh, oh yes, he did. He in fact uh, did injure himself, shot himself in the foot. But uh, adjusting his holster. Just one of those things that tends to happen when you are, of course, carrying a concealed weapon. You're, if you're doing it safely, and, and, you know, I mean, we don't know that he was carrying in an unsafe manner. If he's got a holster, he's already ahead of the game. Speaking of learning about gun culture, there's a, a huge cohort among gun culture that thinks that sticking a pistol in your waistband is just fine without a holster. Well, this guy's got a holster, and yet... I don't know. Somehow it's uncomfortable. So he's adjusting his holster and it's just one of those things. He's 23. He couldn't have been concealed carrying for all that long. And golly, add a, a gun to the mix, a handheld instant death machine that doesn't always kill everybody that it hits, of course, but it fires projectiles damn it, designed to damage human bodies and human tissue. 
and you introduce that into the standard something's bothering me about my clothing mix and you know there's a little part of these things that if you press them <laughs> projectiles fire out and uh you know golly it it actually takes 100 percent total awareness of that object that inanimate object that can't hurt anybody at all times in order to carry these things safely. And of course, you swear on a stack of Bibles that that's exactly what you'll do the day you get your hands on the gun. And then eventually the day comes, maybe let's say two years later, that uh, you don't. And the gun goes off in the middle of Kroger and golly. And now I guess Kroger gets a chance once again as a corporate entity to decide, do we put up signs at the doors that say, no guns, please, because you guys keep firing them in here. This is not the first one in a Kroger store. It's been a couple. I mentioned the Pinterest board. It is out there, and I love to tweet that around. And it struck me just the other day as I was rounding up a story like this one and reporting it out. And people now, a heightened awareness of gun issues because of the march, because of the school shootings, etc. And uh, as we debate, should there be guns in schools? Uh, you, you can, I mean, I, I've been looking at the issue of, well, how often are mistakes made with guns in schools, either by teachers or by those armed school resource officers or anybody. And it's, uh, it's infrequent in total, thankfully, but it's not non-existent. And I just want to collect these stories to give people some basis on which to decide these things because individually these these debates will happen in local communities and there'll be town meetings and school board meetings and people will say uh you know based on the the, the fear that they have of school shootings which is justifiable and they'll come and they'll say we really need to have armed guards or armed teachers in these schools you'll be sorry if you don't if a shooter shows up and there's nobody there to stop them and there's so much to debate about that, but one point of the debate is, you know, what will happen while we're waiting? Suppose, thank God, we survive it all and a shooter never comes to our school. Will anything happen with the guns floating around in our school while we wait? What do you mean while we wait? What do you, you know, a, a lot of people tend to see this issue only in terms of the uh, very scary, very frightening flashpoints that emerge in the, in the timeline. Uh, it's, it's school shootings, actual incidents of school shootings that drive the way I think about this. And it's understandable. I mean, I think it's probably human nature. I think smarter humans uh, will stop and think, okay, well, what about if you're carrying a weapon? I mean, you're talking about somebody who's going to carry a weapon every day for hours and hours, maybe for years, maybe for their entire careers. If you're, if you're lucky, if things go well for their entire careers without encountering a shooter, will there be any accidents along the way? And very many people don't realize how many gun accidents there are. And part of the problem is, in fact, gun culture. The good part of gun culture, the good part of gun culture, which says we train everyone thoroughly in how to use these weapons and how to avoid accidents. And if you just do that, Okay, well, it's been your experience that you have just done that. Maybe you're a very smart, very thorough, very careful person, and you have had this experience. The problem is that there are lots of people who are not thorough or are not careful and have had this experience, but worse, people who are thorough and are careful and still have that experience anyway. And, you know, you might want to respond to the question of whether or not you arm teachers or arm security officers in school by simply looking at how often are these mistakes made in schools. But I don't think that provides you with a complete picture. What about elsewhere? What about places where people think they're doing, they really think they're doing a public service, not just protecting themselves in many cases. They think they're doing a public service by going armed to Kroger. Well, I'm not only protecting myself on the way to and from Kroger and everywhere else I go, but all the shoppers in Kroger are safe from, you name it, uh, robbers, ISIS, uh, school shooters who confuse uh, local grocery stores with their school buildings, whatever. You're going to be safe because I'll take out the shooter. And of course, that doesn't happen very often anyway, which is a whole other debate. But what does happen quite frequently is that the people who have gone armed to these stores have accidentally fired those weapons, sometimes injuring themselves worse, sometimes injuring others in the stores 
for no reason whatsoever. I had no intention of that gun being fired, removed from my person, anything. I wasn't going to draw it. I wasn't going to use it. I was going to threaten anybody. I wasn't going to show anybody. It was supposed to be concealed, and instead there was an explosion and blood. Good job concealing it, by the way. And it happens fairly frequently. So like I said, I've collected these stories and now I'm able to tweet out things like that. Every time one of these things happens, you know, if you don't think, if you think this is an outlier, you think this is really unusual, and it is, statistically speaking, yes, it's an outlier. Yes, it's unusual. But how unusual? Here are 475 other times this crap has happened. Almost exactly the same thing, whether it be in a grocery store, in a church, in a hotel, in a movie theater, in a restaurant. It happens all the time. It's by far the minority, yes, and gun enthusiasts love to point that out. Well, the accident rate is, you know, an infinitesimally small. Sure, but I think the people who are making this decision about whether or not to put those guns in rooms with children should know about how often, like, you know, it would make an impression on them to say in the last couple of years, 475 times that I've found just by searching Google News, people have accidentally, with no intention whatsoever, set guns off in places that you wouldn't want them to be in the first place, much less have them being fired. You ought to know that. So I tell people. And uh, speaking of the other, one of the other points of debate in the armed teacher slash school resource officer debate. Uh, you might recall, if you uh, fell asleep for the weekend, you might remember the, nonetheless, previous week or so, the NRA and other gun enthusiasts making a huge deal in a way that might have perhaps, well, they might they, they definitely went overboard, but there's certainly something to be said uh, about the story of the Great Mills High School shooting in Maryland, I guess now two going on two weeks ago, the, uh, uh, well, guy who showed up at school with a gun and basically shot, I, it sounds like a girl who he used to date who broke up with him. I mean, a horrible story and uh, not, I, I don't necessarily put it in the same category as showing up and randomly shooting up a school, but it's dangerous and more common, far more common than the spectacular school shootings are personally motivated, uh, horrific stories where people have grudges of one kind or another and they bring a gun to school and people get hurt. Uh, and once again, initial reports from the scene don't end up matching with reality when you the cold, hard reality of things, when you can sit back and do forensics reports and uh, medical examiner reports, et cetera. Uh, and you find out that one, that situation we heard about was, well, let's see, two students were shot. One was fatally injured. One was shot in the leg. And then the shooter himself shot by the armed school resource officer, uh, thereafter regarded as a hero, in particular by the NRA and gun enthusiasts. Look, a good guy with a gun stopped the bad guy with the gun. A couple of things ended up, we ended up finding out about that over the weekend. One, the second student that was wounded in all of this was not shot separately. The shooter fired once. He shot his ex-girlfriend and killed her. The same bullet which he fired at her also injured this other student. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, after having been lectured extensively about this by the NRA and the NRA's representative, Dana Loesch in particular, who spent a tremendous amount of time at the end of last week telling everybody, oh, the lying mainstream media won't tell you that the armed good guy with a gun, the school resource officer stopped a mass shooting in Great Mills, just like we told you he would. And very few people, by the way, have ever objected to having armed school resource officers in schools. Lots of, oh, I shouldn't say very few people. There are a lot of you. It's a minority. And a lot of you have very good reason to object to it. And we could go over those some other time, perhaps. But uh, in general, there's a lot less resistance to the idea of trained police officers allow, being allowed to be armed on campus, though they have never stopped a school shooter to date and, in fact, have in, in, in some cases refused to engage school shooters because the school shooters have them outgunned. 
But this one was supposed to be like the big win. And they were actually even going overboard and portraying it. Look, it's a win for Trump. Somehow it was being portrayed as a win for Trump, as though he had come up with this idea. But big lectures all weekend about we told you libtards that this was the way it was going to work. And now finally you see it. And now, now that it's happened, notice that the lying media won't even report it, which of course was ridiculous because the reason we weren't all saying, Oh my God, Dana Loesch is just lying through her teeth about this is we had all read it in the mainstream lying press, the one that wouldn't report it. That's how we knew she wasn't just making the story up. But that, didn't turn out to be entirely true either because she was kind of making the story up. What we had was uh, a story of a school shooter who was confronted by a school resource officer who drew his weapon and fired at the shooter and the shooter fell mortally wounded to the ground and later died. And so uh, you can understand why somebody might who might have witnessed that or heard the story would come away saying school resource officer stopped the mass shooter how do you know he was a mass shooter? He shot another kid. Okay, well, as it turns out, that was a stray from the first shot that he took. He had no intention of shooting anybody else, and he, in fact, wandered the school for three minutes after the initial shooting without firing another shot. Another thing that we can find out in the cold light of reason later on is the school resource officer, of course, had a different gun than this shooter. You can tell, if you look carefully, which bullets went where? And the new story is, guess what? He missed. He shot the shooter in the hand. The shooter shot himself and killed himself, shot himself in the head and died just the way almost every potential mass shooter or school shooter ends with or without a school resource officer around. Not saying that the school resource officer wasn't brave, didn't perform admirably, he did, although I do have some questions about that guy, but perhaps could save those for a later date. Point is, the news is that the high school shooter in Great Mills died by shooting himself. The school resource officer didn't do it. That doesn't stop gun enthusiasts from saying, well, he shot himself in the head at that point because he was confronted with armed resistance. And there is some validity to that. I'm just saying that uh, we also have this other data point of trained police officer confronts shooter, very hectic situation, kids all over the place, can't imagine the stress, got to be trained. This is why you want SROs rather than teachers. And with all the training, I mean, he essentially missed. If the guy didn't decide he was there to commit suicide, if he was going to shoot it out, who knows what happens? They were pretty close to one another. There was a big confrontation. Shooting a shooter in the hand isn't going to do the trick. He didn't want to shoot him in the hand. He wanted to stop him. It just didn't work. So, you know, that that's the cold, hard reality of it. And uh, in case you missed that story, I think I have to bring it to your attention. And I also think it's time now to shift to uh, back to the news a little bit, I think, Besides uh, my pet peeves and, and how expensive college is, which I think I knew already anyway, because Joan McCarter is here, has been waiting patiently. Thank you, Joan. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. I'm college already? Yeah. I, I know. You guys were on hand, I think, uh, for me to announce that these kids were born. We were blogging and talking about things like that way back in, in those days even. Um, wow. Yeah, college already, and it's not early or anything. It's regular time. And, uh, of course, I somehow I ended up on, like, the most expensive college campuses in the country, maybe the world. I don't know. But uh, warning for all of you, uh, uh, perhaps with those days ahead, uh, the, the admissions officers and financial aid officers were all, like, flush and fanning themselves over the prospect of having to meet with a new cohort of parents and crossing a, you know, one of the $10,000 thresholds when you move, you know, the, the price, total price of attendance goes up and crosses a new threshold. Uh, your, your basic small liberal arts college in the East uh, now looking at topping $70,000 a year total cost of attendance between tuition, books, room, board, food, etc. I don't know how anybody is able to do that who doesn't, you know, maybe the people who can afford it don't need college as much. They can just sit on their investment portfolios or something. I 
I, it's probably speaking out of turn because, uh, you know, there, I'm sure there are plenty of people. We read about it all the time in the New York Times. I make a half a million dollars and I can barely survive in New York City. But a lot of interesting tales from the financial aid officers about uh, parents saying, uh, you know, I need more financial aid. Well, we think you can do more. But what about my boat? <laughs> kind of Very entertaining <laughs> people. Good to talk. Yeah, to. It was, uh... Scary. But yeah, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the good news is lots of financial aid and scholarships and things uh, available. But uh, by all means, have your uh, children lift weights and join sports programs. It seems yes. to be the only answer. <laughs> Boy. Oh, well. Congratulations on having a smart kid. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I hope I don't have to uh, disappoint them terribly. I mean, it, it is that's essentially what's happening around the country. I'm not I'm, I'm about the 400 millionth person to discover, uh, hey, you deserve to be in an elite college, but wouldn't you rather not be in debt for the rest of your life? Yeah. What do you think? Uh, you know, and, and you got to make choices for some people. Uh, those kinds of schools are essential to, you know, unlocking their actual potential. And if you send them to the uh, very, uh, you know, very good and very comparable education at the state school, but they're one of 50,000 students, you know, it's a different outcome. Other kids thrive in that atmosphere. So uh, that's another thing. Have your kids lift weights and address large crowds. <laughs> <laughs> I guess at all time, and you're and you're golden. If you could just if you could all just be state U quarterbacks, everything would be great. But uh, wouldn't not, it? Yeah. Oh, uh, but then of course they would all need uh, uh, orthopedic surgery eventually too. Man. So that's also expensive. So you're really screwed either way. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes. So uh, back off of uh, my pet peeve, I guess. <laughs> For the moment, uh, but uh, but not much happening uh, in in Washington D.C. as it cleared out for the protest. Too all the all the politicians ran away just in time, mm -hmm. right? So and didn't have you've got to gotta think that getting that omnibus through as quickly as they did had something to do with not being there on Saturday. Yes, big threat holding out over there. That's a that's a good strategy. We need to arrange one of those every weekend. <laughs> I like that idea. Yeah. I mean, people well, are we're energized okay by them. That's September. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. What's uh, So what, what, where do we stand? What is happening here? We got the omnibus through, and uh, Trump, Trump is apparently still roiling over it privately. He's still mad that he didn't get his wall funding. I love this. I love this. <laughs> his, his signing ceremony, or whatever it was, where he once again forgot to sign the bill. Uh, oh, did he again? <laughs> Yeah, he oh was sitting God. there on, on his little oh, end table, seen his this. signing end table. Huge stack, the folder, everything. He walked out of the room without signing. Wow. Uh, With the staffer, you know, grabbing it up and running after him. Now, that's at least a half a dozen times, I think. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, well, he's he's really mentally not there. No, he's not. Mm. It's astonishing. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, now... But, just so everybody knows, if he doesn't sign it, it doesn't matter, actually. I mean, he likes to sign things and then show them. And, and it's embarrassing for him to show up, say he's going to sign it, and then forget. But yeah. technically speaking, if he doesn't sign it uh, and Congress is still in session after 10 days, it just becomes law anyway. So uh, it, it, you, you can't veto by not signing except at the end of a uh, end of a session. Right. But uh, OK, so that's pretty dopey. But yeah, he was fulminating. That he didn't get his his money, which is, of course, amazing to those of us who remember uh, that Mexico was supposed to pay for the wall. Oh, yeah. But what about that? I don't know. I mean, I would <laughs> well, not now. Yeah. <laughs> now he wants the Pentagon to pay for the wall. Oh, yeah. That was another sort of weird admission like. Uh, that's so ordinarily when a de He's, Democrat says something like that, it's so easily translated into you hate the troops. Yeah. Hmm. He, he's actually, you know, called up Paul Ryan. Apparently he's talking to staff. He's trying to get somebody who will tell him that, yeah, never mind the appropriations process and how hmm. government actually works. We can just take all of this money because 
the Pentagon is rich now. Oh yeah, that's true. As, oh, he, as he said, <laughs> our our, our Defense out. Department is now rich because we gave them all this money. So we just take some money from that and put it into our border wall. Okay, I mean, it's I, you can make the argument it's defense. I mean, I guess building a wall on your border isn't that far removed from tra- well, like traditional. When I say traditional, I mean like ancient Chinese defense. You know, <laughs> they did it right. Great Wall of China. They did it. Fantastic. Yeah. Worked uh, not that well, but but it's a tourist attraction now. Maybe that's it. The, the our, our transparent wall can become a, a tourist attraction. Yeah. So, uh, uh, all right. Well, this was a very weird situation. Uh, the fact that he's still mad about it, the fact that he's still walking around saying, I wish I had vetoed it. There was that weird moment uh, on Friday that you, uh, you were with us to, to talk about, too, like, that he was still like, maybe I'll veto this thing. Yeah. And, and, and in his st- signing speech ceremony, not signing the bill, <laughs> Mm. He said, "I want to do the veto." <laughs> what? A, uh, I, I wish I had watched it. Now I didn't. I don't think I. I realized. Oh, it was. It was unhinged. It was. He. He clearly. It, but I really didn't get. Was sense. being forced to sign it. I want to do the. I want to do a veto. Where's the veto? I wonder if he thinks there's a stamp like I did uh, because of Schoolhouse Rock. You know. Yeah. A, where's the veto stamp? Where? where you know he's it. itching to do a veto. Yeah, uh, but he nothing just... gets passed by this Congress. So there's not even anything to. Well, yeah, that's his problem. <laughs> uh, and of course, he wants to claim that there's, you know, oh, I, we're breaking records of the number of bills that I sign. So if you veto them, you won't have, you won't build a yeah, bigger record. Get right. to sign. Well, uh, so that that is very weird. I do wish I had seen him say that. I didn't realize that. He... Right at the ceremony. <laughs> One, he forgets to sign it. Two, I still want to veto it. Is it okay to do that? Wow. Well, and then you heard what he demanded. Uh, I don't. I was so out of it. <laughs> People were telling. I mean, <laughs> you were so. <laughs> even on Friday, I was packing, getting ready to go. Boss, oh yeah. He uh, demanded the line item veto. Oh yes, right. That's right. Right. That unconstitutional thing. That unconstitutional thing that apparently the White House was completely unprepared to discuss and understand because then Steve Nuchin showed up on, I think it was CNN on Sunday yeah, and said, we've got to have the line item veto. Uh, okay. And I mean. No, it was not Fox News because it was um, the son of the guy who isn't a wingnut who's on Fox. Uh I'm very bad with names. That's an interesting description. Uh, uh... <laughs> Wallace. <laughs> well, oh, yes. Right. The son of the guy who isn't. Uh, the, so dad isn't the wingnut. Okay. No, I, I was like, a son of a guy and the guy isn't the wingnut. Okay. Got it. Anyway. <laughs> You're right. Chris Wallace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> really bad at names. <laughs> I, the I had to explain to him. Well, no, the yeah. line item veto is unconstitutional supreme court has said so manuch comes back well congress can come up with a rule to fix that uh and yeah <laughs> wallace was no no you and guys, then they moved on <laughs> uh, oh, i i mean i guess you feel like you have to i don't know why i don't know why they i, I wish they could just spend the rest of the time beating them up over that and say, you know, you ri- what is it? Is it is it that you're dumb? Is there, it that you're rich? Which was it that, that you weren't uh, paying any attention? There has to be some old. You bar know this. that these people must cross mm-hmm. in order to be cabinet officials and president. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't. I guess it's 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 not surprising at all that Trump had no idea that he couldn't do this, that sure. it was unconstitutional yes. because it's Trump. Right. Um, but then you would yeah. think preparing folks to go out on the Sunday circuit and talk about this stuff. Mm-hmm. Somebody somewhere would have said, you know, we can't do this. This is not a thing to bring up because it makes us look stupid. I, yeah, I, I guess I'm astonished, sort of, that that's the case. Although, 
Well, I don't know. They're very dumb people, for one thing. Uh, and we'll take a break to regroup and think about it a little bit. But uh, I just think back on the, this election and every other election when there's been a really stupid Republican candidate. You know, basically people say it doesn't really matter. They're surrounded by people who know what they're doing. They'll be well exactly. advised. They'll and, hire good people. Yeah. And apparently uh, not only I mean, he went out of his way to hire bad people for one thing and uh, people who really just legitimately never learned that lesson amazing we'll yeah. be back in uh, two minutes to complain about it some more hi it's me David Waldman your host for Kago in the morning interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of Kago in the morning thousands of you are downloading the show each day but fewer than one in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air for the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy. You can find us there by searching KGROX or David Waldman or KGRO in the morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box, and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. All right, so let's talk about how bad Republican government is. Well, now's the time and, to, to and blame do that, it on as a matter of fact. As our uh, we come back from our break and back, welcome to back to the uh, Kicker in the Morning Show. As we uh, we've been plotting where we'll take you during our next segment with Joan McCarter, and uh, again expressing our astonishment at the the fiftieth time that uh, the president has walked out without signing his thing and noting as Armando did he, <laughs> like he did with the Stormy Daniels. Uh, NDA agreement. Oh, by the way, NDA is back in the news everywhere too. As, as it turns out, just parenthetically, uh, I guess everybody at the the infamous Trump Tower meeting of June 2016 with Natalia Veselnitskaya and others, uh, oh, also had to sign uh, non disclosure agreements about that meeting about which we know so much now. So those things don't hold water ever. <laughs> Apparently. I hadn't heard that one. Yeah, that's because really you don't want to talk about Russian adoption outside of this room. Yes, right, exactly. Please don't let anyone know we want to help orphans get adopted by loving families in the United States. Shh, shh, shh. Can't have anybody know anything about that. Uh, meanwhile, we know everything about the meeting, and also like the idea of, well, you need to sign this non-disclosure agreement because if you talk about it, I'm going to get you. You know, so KGB officer. <laughs> sign this you know this russian military intelligence operatives i don't think are going to be intimidated by i'll sue you in america <laughs> that'll learn you that doesn't usually work okay, oh my goodness well. uh so well we were when we, when we left off though we were <laughs> talking about uh wow what were, oh yes the uh the the clamor for the line item veto and the amazing scenario in which no one surrounding the president has any recollection of the Clinton administration era effort to to pass a line item veto or something similar to a line item veto and it being uh, found unconstitutional. And they don't remember this, as, as I said on the break, even though it's filmed in color and everything. It, not like you have to go back to the black and white archives. These were uh, adults who were already billionaires at the time. And presumably they're in New York reading the New York Times. You thought they were educated people. And it turns out that they were ignorant morons. And he's staffed an entire White House with them. I, I, I guess imagine there's also probably an age gap too. And your 20 something staffers may not remember from history class that this happened, but uh, apparently it's not the only like basic constitutional issue that they don't know anything about and <laughs> and didn't learn any lessons and, and may not know anything about. They're, no, so they're moving in another direction. Not the only thing. It's, okay. it's one of, I have a pet peeve about going back to sort of the Ross Perot movement and I'm trying to remember what the group called themselves mm -hmm. coming out of the Ross Perot thing. It may but, not his 
reform party or something else? Yeah, it was. It, what was the name of the group? Well, there's been so many that have occupied the there same have. space. Sort of a a less radical tea party, mm-hmm. but okay. still founded on the basic idea that there are gimmicks that will solve everything. Mm, okay. That believe that a balanced budget amendment, that term That's limits. It. Oh, or yeah. that line item vetoes will solve all of our problems. Ah, now you're probably thinking of a different group, but it occurred to me that the uh, you're describing the uh, House Republican Conference of 1995. Well, yes, <laughs> but yes. the contract with America essentially yes was the very same thing, uh, and, and involved most of those items, and most of those items were huge failures and couldn't go anywhere because they were simplistic, idiotic approaches to so-called solutions sometimes for problems that didn't exist uh but otherwise even when they addressed real problems did so unconstitutionally um and from an authoritarian perspective that made no sense and from gingrich's end this was knowingly bad i mean he knew they were gimmicks Mm -hmm. gingrich is smart enough to understand that this is not how our government is set up this is not how things work yeah. And that we can't just say, okay, let's have a line item veto, term limits, and a balanced budget amendment, and all of our problems are solved. He knew that those are things that people would latch on to. Yeah. Because they're simple care. solutions. And uh, yeah, he probably figured at the time, well, I'll be in charge, so it's okay. Even if idiots support this stuff, I'll be able to, you know. Pull the levers and we'll have a working government, smaller, cheaper, uh, in his mind, but uh, but it would work. And then he, what he didn't, I guess, figure on is empowering, raging, literally raging morons will, one, consume you in the fire, and two, yes. leave those morons in charge. Yes, and, which is wow. what we have now. Yeah. The morons are in charge. Yeah. So, so the House Republican morons playbook, political playbook, is reporting this morning, are probably going to spend the rest of the year talking about passing a balanced budget amendment. <laughs> okay. Uh, because what else are you going to do with the rest of this year? I don't know. And how amazing is, is that? Now, I guess I should begin by asking, when did they get the idea that the budget should be balanced? That's a very good question. Because that's not what I just saw. Right. We just saw, what, a nearly $2 trillion tax cut? Yeah. And then a $1.3 trillion spending bill? Yes. Both of those things with T's, trillions. Uh, Yeah. And, And this did not happen. Nobody tried to balance the budget. And uh, we just had a whole raft of articles by, I don't know, you know, smart pundits saying Republicans no longer believe in fiscal conservatism. Now, we knew that, but the pundits were willing to say it, which is the new thing. And, yeah, and so, which is marginally helpful. Yeah, it's nice when they they've say woken so. up to that fact. So a balanced budget amendment, and of course an amendment requiring you know super majorities in both houses and then ratification. It's not that it's impossible, but uh, but it's yeah. impossible. I mean the numbers right now make it impossible. Ordinarily, under other circumstances, you might in fact see some not insignificant, maybe even democratic support for the idea, but only during those periods in which. People believe that Republicans are serious about fiscal conservatism and and that people who are either afraid of Republicans or or represent swing districts or what have you or are trying to to wear the mantle of fiscal conservatism think there's a majority to work with. And it seems so clear that there isn't one now. Uh, they, but there will they, be people they who They can't run on their tax cut bill. Yeah, nobody's getting any tax cuts. For nobody's time. getting any tax cuts. I should call it a tax cut law because it is now law. Yes, true. Um, 
so they can't really run on it. It's kind of embarrassing to run on having spent one point three trillion dollars and mm. calling yourself fiscally responsible. So they don't have a whole lot to fall back on with their base, which they need desperately. Yeah. They didn't repeal Obamacare. No. They don't have a border wall. No. So what they're going to have to do then is pull out this dusty old gimmick and and run on it. I guess so. That's uh, one of the last or one of the longest uh, remaining items in the campaign in a box that these guys have run on since. For, I mean, we've probably been, been doing a balanced budget amendment uh, 30 years that we've actually been, you know, the, that might have been the last time that that thing made it to the floor, actually. I think so. Yeah. Uh, so it's been a long time. And the ideology that spawned it is dead and buried and but it's still around it's still written so let's do it i guess uh even though we spent the whole rest of the year doing this other uh, going in the total opposite direction it's bizarre that that would come up is that they want to spend the rest of the year on that do they is that paul ryan on is, is... Uh, yeah i you know it's just a playbook paragraph like this so. is what they are hearing so Hmm, you know, the okay, other thing okay. that we were hearing a few Maybe days ago crap, from though. House Republicans was that Paul Ryan was resigning. Yes, right. I, <laughs> that was very exciting for a moment. but uh, <laughs> Which I love. I want somebody from the Freedom Caucus at least once a week to circulate the rumor that Paul Ryan is <laughs> retiring. <laughs> they, may, they may have done that. Maybe that was it. I, uh, it it might have been part of it. It was yeah. Mark Amaday from Nevada, who is definitely a Freedom Caucus type. Okay. And, you know, where's Ted Yoho on this? <laughs> well, that's that was a bizarre thing, also, and uh, but yeah, I mean, we, it was even accompanied with like speculation. Well, maybe he's going to be joining the cabinet. That's something that a speaker might actually resign for. Uh, of course, that would be foolish to join the Trump cabinet. You'll oh, I can't imagine trashed. anybody with half a brain is wanting to join the Trump cabinet. No, right I, you now. know, <laughs> and, I, and he's got that half. Somewhere. Uh, mm. So it's possible that he might. But yeah, I, I don't well, know. The half Weird of his rumor. brain that's extremely political and thinks he can be president. Yeah. Knows yeah. that it would be uh, that would be over if I joined the Trump cabinet. All right. Well, let's see. So that was kind of a bizarro thing. Now, balanced budget amendment. OK, that might just be pundit. It chatter could then. just be. OK. I, it could be Freedom Caucus type saying this is the thing that we need to have, so let me raise it up there, and that'll make us talk mm. about it. Yes. But at the same time, it would not surprise me at all that this is what Republican leadership wants to spend the rest of the year on because they don't have anything else. No one they told no. us, basically, with the omnibus spending bill that that's going to be the last hurrah. The only thing that they'll work on post that is nominations in the Senate. Okay. The the House can go home? <laughs> right. I guess Well, so. I'm sure there are going to be lots of post offices. Yes, yes. Right. There are always post offices. Yeah, you got to name them after somebody. They can't just be post offices, you know. Uh, how many have we got? Are we running out? We're not building any more. Uh, and we haven't named them all at this point? Well, they, they're being renamed. Oh, Okay. Yeah, I guess that's true. What uh, and people were are we are they out of favor now? <laughs> what, what, what are we doing? I don't even know what's happening. I guess you just rename it I every couple no of years. I have no idea how the post office thing works. Yeah, I mean it keeps them busy. So yeah, you know. okay. So that's what they'll do, and the Senate nominations, and that's that will eat up the rest of their time, and they may run into. I guess this this is where. Uh, filibuster reforms new frontier comes in. There's a couple of Republican senators, but only a couple frustrated with the pace of nominations, even though they also keep saying that they're that the pace for judicial nominations is a record and it is. Yeah. Uh, which is dangerous and terrible for on the one hand, but yeah. So on the other considering hand, considering who the nominees are, right. yes, yes, the actual outcomes are, are terrible and dangerous, but the record number of judges appointed and approved and still 
sour grapes. We're still angry at how long this is taking. Right. And be- we be- before it. we get mm. on to filibuster, which absolutely I want to talk about, yes. let's just go back to the danger of their focusing okay. on the balanced budget amendment for a little bit. Oh, sure. Because we know what this is setting up for. Because they told us when they were passing this tax bill Mm -hmm. that they were going to turn immediately to entitlement cuts. Okay. Yes. So so that's the undercurrent of a balanced budget discussion that that we have to recognize and and be concerned about while we're laughing at them because they are going to start using this moment now to set the groundwork for trying to make entitlement cuts. Okay. And that is a good point. And and though, yeah, we uh, I forgot about it. I mean, we've, we've made that point. A number of times, and it was, uh, you know, it's beginning to lose its power. Perhaps, oh, they were, were always constantly warning about this, but this time, this time they're crazy, <laughs> and on top of it, all. Oh, and uh, I guess it's entirely possible, and certainly a balanced budget amendment, whether they pass it or not, if they can rally behind it, and because it's such a familiar sounding thing, it, it actually rolls off the tongue. Everybody knows that. And the word that follows balanced budget is amendment. Uh, mm-hmm. That's the way people understand the thing. And so in that context, that will harken back to days of, you know, Republican fiscal conservatism and stability. It's a good it's a good PR play for Donald Trump. To, instead of talking about dumb stuff that's uniquely Trump you know, for the Congress to shift focus to that old standby of rock ribbed Republicanism is a good idea, even if they don't pass it. And in that context, you know, we'll never get a balanced budget if we don't all first, you know, starve every grandparent in America or make people eat cat food or uh, stop They're not going to get Trump to say that. No, they don't need him but... to say it. But but it will be setting a theme for the next Congress should Republicans win. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's an interesting game that they have to play because they can't go out this election year saying we need, they they can just talk generally about cutting spending. They can't focus on what they want to cut. They want to completely Mm -hmm. destroy social security and Medicare. They can't say that out loud, but they can talk about fiscal responsibility. They can talk about out of control deficits. And uh, in speaking to constituents, whether directly or indirectly, I suppose, uh, saying I'm spending the rest of my time on the balanced budget amendment, uh, people find that hard to criticize. That's, that's, you know, a silver bullet gimmick thing that people can latch on to without really thinking about what does that mean? What's behind that? How does that work? Right. That's stupid for you to be thinking about. You just blew the budget up and... You know, it doesn't really matter for one thing, but it, and it's not going to be something that somebody's going to debate in the street with you. Uh, if you say, what, that's crazy. You're against balanced budgets. And that's really all it takes. That's all it takes. Hmm. And all that it takes for them now is trying to find something that will motivate their base to come out and vote for them this fall. Yeah. Even though the answer, by the way, to you're against balanced budgets is, no, you're against balanced budgets. <laughs> I just saw you vote against it. So I guess you can keep that in mind. If you find yourself in that confrontation on the rope line somewhere or at the 4th of July parade. Uh, all right. Yeah. So uh, definitely uh, yeah, the, the bigger picture there, the fact that they would even float something that dumb is really just uh, apparently a good a good protective front for a – renewed attack on social security medicaid medicare etc uh all the because you know it's coming yeah. because they told us it was that is true they have been very clear about that or at least the speaker has been and, yes uh, all right so that's probably right. yes the better point you are correct. so that's the gimmick on the house side okay now we have filibuster reform on the senate side which is not a gimmick mm. but i <laughs> <laughs> That could happen. It could happen. And it, I, do, I actually don't think it'll happen. I don't think McConnell has the votes to do it. The latest uh, proposal being, am, am I up to speed in uh, saying that the latest is to, what, to get rid of post-closure debate time on nominations? Yes. All right. Yes. And that's not a completely it, nutty idea. It's, it's just terrible for It's not a completely nutty guys. idea. But for a lot of Republicans, it's that slippery slope. 
Okay. For a lot of Democrats, too. All right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I've, I have gained a new appreciation for it as a delaying tactic. I mean, it is annoying and it doesn't do anything. And it is kind of weird in the grand scheme of things. But on the other hand, I suppose uh, if you're we've never really had a uh, a lockstep conveyor belt system like they have here now for uh, really just uncritical, unthinking approval of people who are so wildly unqualified, not just judges, but for all of the uh, a lot of the executive nominations. It 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 does make you aware of the necessity to occasionally slow down and just read the newspaper clippings on these people, and you'll get a very different idea. You don't need yeah, to find out if they've them. ever actually yeah. tried a case in front of a judge. Yes, right. Just or a if they're being claimed to fame as being a ghost hunter. Yeah, yeah. And, and these are things that only a few minutes will will uncover, really. And and you don't even get that the the one you. you Mentioned there the uh, the questioning of some of the judicial nominees. Did, have you ever tried a case? Uh, only came up in the context of what they had a panel of three judges whose nominations were up, and the uh, members of the, judi- the judiciary committee each had five minutes to question all three of them. Yes. So you had about a minute to talk to each one of the nominees, and that's all it takes, of course, to ask: ha- Have you ever really been a you know a trial lawyer? Have you ever tried a case in front of a jury? No. Okay. That that would be something we would want to slow down and consider. Not that we'd need 30 hours necessarily to consider it. But, no. Uh, in every other context, that's how, how much rushing is going on in here. It's, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, Grassley well, thinks and, it's and, appropriate to know, do things this way. In a normal world, you would have had a White House that vetted these yes. people. So that they wouldn't get to the actual nomination level. Yeah, that's true. They wouldn't be appearing before the Senate in a confirmation hearing. Yeah, and I so, guess that's what makes it even worse. And I, I like is there any indication that was Grassley embarrassed by that? Do we know? It does, I mean, I guess normally where you think the White House is doing some vetting, I suppose you could lean on that and say, look, how many minutes do you want? I mean, yeah, they're normal people. You don't agree with them, but they're they're lawyers. They're going to be judges. It's just the way it's going to work. Well, I don't know. One of them's a ghost hunter. Oh, <laughs> oh all right. One of them's never tried a case. Eh, that happens too. But uh, you know, some of them are Nazis. Uh, Eighteen of them beat their wives. What are you doing? How come we don't have? So you want to get rid of the thirty hours? I understand, but that's if if we get half an hour to question each of them, I'd be okay with that. Yeah. If I get one minute. We get no. five minutes. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, I have not seen any indication at all that Grassley's bothered by this. Oh well. Uh, not surprising. He's uh, he doesn't really seem like he thinks deeply about stuff in general. No. Okay. Uh, would Orrin Hatch have been embarrassed? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. He seems like he thinks more deeply about things, but I don't know that he would have gotten to the level of embarrassment about process. I, yeah, no, I don't All think right. so. Um, to his credit, Bill Kennedy from Louisiana is yes. kind of embarrassed by it. Yeah, I oh, mean, he was it gives a, him a great right. way to grandstand and do his folksy grandpa thing. Yeah, I mean, but uh, it it is doing a service. He's by the one that did pointing that. out that these people are really. Really incredibly unqualified. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it would have been had he not done it, but it wasn't a Democrat that asked this guy if he had ever tried a case. And did he know what certain, you know, per- basic procedural rules were or meant? Uh, it was a Republican. So uh, where were where were Democrats on that? I mean, I guess there were, at some point. If you're moving so many nominees so quickly, you just say, well, I'm voting no on all of them. So that's for starters. Uh, but, yeah, it would have been nice to have seen Democrats out there saying you're also wildly unqualified. Here's why I'm voting no. Yeah. Although, you know, it's good for the base. to Just say, I don't, you know what? They might be qualified, but they're also crazy and they're Trump nominees. So my answer is no. But 
doesn't work. Which in should be the default position of every Democratic senator. Yeah. Uh, some of them. Until somebody stellar comes along, which isn't going to happen because it's Trump. Yeah. But back to the idea that they have to start, that, that somehow it's Democrats that are obstructing all of this with the 30 hours of debate. There are so many vacant positions. He's doing pretty good at, at mm. churning out judgeships, but executive nominees, there's 75, I think I saw, State Department positions that haven't even been identified mm. yeah. with candidates. I, I, some some ridiculous number like that. They're not getting the nominees. Yeah, that's not the Democrats' fault. That's that's definitely true, uh, and some have said that that is by design so that the you know upper level uh, political appointees can just run everything and there's no middle management to get in their way. But it's clearly that plus I don't know anybody who could do this or would want to for this administration. That's also okay. a possibility. I, I, it's it's a big problem for them finding people willing to work for them. It's yeah. true. Uh, <laughs> look, and uh, look at how difficult it is to get a lawyer. Yeah, I, <laughs> that's true. Uh, the president of the United States somehow can't find anybody willing to represent him. That also a big problem. And speaking of judges, not even uh, it's not even limited. I guess it's just Republican wide issue, not just limited to the federal judiciary, where we're having very significant. Uh, worries about the judiciary here on the federal level with them packing it with nut bars. But on the state level, where in Pennsylvania, they're uh, talking about impeaching Democratic. And they have elected state Supreme Court judges there to uh, impeaching them if you don't uh, rule in favor of Republicans in significant cases. And in Wisconsin, uh, in Wisconsin, that just came up uh, what was in the, what the, the setup of the story in Wisconsin uh, I'm off the top of my head was about what um, uh, Walker's refusal elections. to have right. special elections That's for it. vacancies. Yes. Thank you. Uh, right. And just refusing to have these special elections and then being ordered to do so by the court. And then rather than doing so instead, did they call it, was it a special legislative session they called to try to uh, try, try and uh, pass a, a bill that would, I guess what limit the the Supreme Court's ability to rule in such cases and overrule their insistence that the elections be called, and then barring all of that, creating a new law that says you can't have I mean, it's, it's very much like the the McConnell rule that you can't a Democratic president can't nominate a Supreme Court justice in the last year. Mm. You can't have a special election less than 124 days from your last spring election or some <sighs> insane thing like that. So they would essentially tailor something and say, oh, it's content neutral. It's not just that we're trying to prevent this election or that election. You just you can't have it so close to other elections. Of course, we're only close to those elections because of your enormous delay in calling the elections. They just do anything they can to not let people vote and anything that they can and do. And to not let people be represented. Yeah. And to not let the law be uh, represented either by judges, independent judiciary that, that say, yeah, there's really a basic structure to government here that you're supposed to be providing. By the way, that's in the Constitution, too. We're guaranteed the Republican form of government. And there's states disassembling their judicial branches. Very Your uh, Republican Party. Thank you, Newt Gingrich. Yeah. I do go back and blame it all on him, really. I, you might as well. You'd be right, I think, in doing that. Uh, simplistic solutions to complex problems. Well, we'll just make it illegal. We'll just and partisan it. solutions to yeah. complex problems. More to the point. Partisanship above right. everything else. Yeah. Uh, not just simplistic. Uh, you're, you're quite right. Uh, we, I would be remiss if we didn't say, yeah stupid but partisan on top of it all you can make a nonpartisan stupid mistake anytime but if you're motivated <laughs> by politics that's all you're going to do all right and this is it is it's really remarkable the the breadth of this problem is astonishing and uh everyone being race it's like a race to become the next the mini trump on the state level 
And we thought Paul LePage was all alone on that one, but people are yeah, gaining Scott steam. Yeah, Scott Walker, folks. He's been at it now for two terms. Amazing. And yeah, he'll go down as a two-term governor like as a success. Unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're uh, out of time for today. Thank you so much for uh, helping me uh, stumble through the first live show back for the week. I you are most it. welcome. Giving us some direction. Thanks, Joan. Uh, we'll do it again next week, although I, maybe I'll be better prepared that time. <laughs> <laughs> you were fine. Okay. You were Thank fine. you. For, I was looking at right, fishing for week. a reassurance. Okay. Very good. Uh, next week then. Thanks, Joan. And uh, back to the soul mines with you. <laughs> Joan McCarter, our senior political writer, taking care of things on the front page. Back to work. Of course, stay tuned for Justice Putnam bringing you the West Coast cookbook and speakeasy. Once again, as is often the case on Wednesdays, I've eaten up all the time for previewing it. But let me see if I can pick out a cool story for you. From Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The Cake Room in the Morning Show with David Waltman. All right, well, as it turns out, as usual, they're all cool stories, but how about this one? Christian Broadcasting Network flack David Brody didn't realize it, but he explained exactly why white evangelicals are hypocrites. And so if you hadn't figured that one out for yourself or you just wanted to see if you were right, stay tuned for Justice bringing you his program right after this.